Well, what we've diagnosed Newman with is an anterior cruciate ligament tear. And the ACL is one of four ligaments in the knee, and it's far and away the most common ligament that they tear. And um, in veterinary medicine, we have looked at a lot of different ways to treat ACL tears, and essentially we've tried almost everything that they've tried in human medicine as far as Dacron grafts, fasciolata grafts, allografts, even from, from other dogs, from cadavers. Um, and the problem with that is there are two things that uh, make a dog's knee very different than a human knee. Number one is that a dog essentially walks in a partially crouched position all the time. And so um, there is tension or stress on their ACL at all times. Whereas with us, our knees are fully extended and so when we're just standing there's not any tension on our ACL. And that's one big difference. And then the other one is just sort of a commonsensical difference. Uh, if, uh, if you have knee surgery and your human surgeon tells you, look, I want you to stay off this knee for eight weeks, you stay off the knee for eight weeks. Whereas in, in dogs, um, they tend to, you know, when they feel well, they think they are well and they want to go. You won't want to miss a day of work. No, no, exactly. <laughs> and, uh, and so for a long time, we had been looking for a better way to treat, particularly the large breed dogs. And um, Dr. Barkley Slocum um, developed a technique called a triple or a uh, tibial plateau leveling osteotomy, TPLO for short. And um, his thought was, uh, one of the other differences of a dog's knee is that our tibia is flat on top, whereas a dog's actually slopes back. And so the femoral condyles, the round part of the femur here, actually wants to fall off of the back of the tibia, which makes the tibia want to go forward. And that's our whole problem when the ACL is torn, is that the tibia can go forward. And so his thought was, if we could flatten the top of the tibia and make it more like a human knee, would that be a way to treat him? And so, essentially, what we do with this procedure is, when their ACL is torn, I beg your pardon, uh, when their ACL is torn, if I feel the knee, and this is what I felt on Newman, I can slide the tibia back and forth, okay? When he puts weight on his foot, what's happening is that tibia is sliding back and forth, and that's our whole problem. With the, the TPLO, all we do is make a cut in the top of the tibia so that we can rotate that back. Now, that doesn't do anything for the ligament, and so if I feel the knee, I can still get that, that instability. But when Newman bears weight on his foot, nothing happens. And the real bottom line is a bone plate and six screws is very strong, and um, the chances of that failing during our eight to 10 week recovery period are much lower than most of the other things that we tried. And so the success rate on the TPLO um, has been significantly higher than some of the other things that we've tried in the past. That's not to say that the TPLO is without complications. Like with any surgery, there are potential complications. Probably the most common things that we see are, number one, infection. Orthopedic infection rate generally runs somewhere between two and a half and four um, percent. Obviously, we wear full caps, masks, gowns, gloves, we use drapes, uh, perioperative antibiotics, and we'll send him home on antibiotics. The problem is we can't sterilize the air. You know, there are bacteria in this room right now. Normally, whatever minor contamination they would get from the air, their immune system would clear that easily. But say two to four percent of the time, it doesn't. Um, and so he can get an infection. Now, we can treat that with antibiotics, but we can't clear that infection unless we eventually come back and take the plate and screws out. It's not a, a huge, huge deal because at that point the bone is healed. He doesn't need the plate and screws anymore. Small incision, minor surgery to take it out, and he lives happily ever after. So it's a complication, certainly, but not a failure. You know, ultimately he can still do very well. The second thing is the tibial tuberosity here, we don't rotate that because that's right where the patellar tendon attaches up to the kneecap and the quadriceps. But where this, this little point of bone that we leave sticking up right there is kind of a weak point early on, and that can crack. Um, generally speaking, if we're going to see that, we'll see that within the first, say, four to six weeks. Um, and it's usually pretty obvious that it's happened because he's doing well, he's using the leg, and then suddenly 
he'll come up acutely lame and you think, oh my gosh, what's happened to him? Um, well, if that were to happen, we'll have you bring him in, we'll x-ray it. If we see that that tibial crest has cracked, but it hasn't moved, we don't do anything. Um, you know, we just tell you to keep him quiet, it'll heal. Um, if it does start to move or migrate, we have had some where we've had to come in and put a couple of pins and a, what we call a tension band wire to stabilize that. Um, so again, it's a complication. It does require a, a second surgery. The incidence of that, though, is low, and uh, you know, single-digit percentages are lower. Um, so um, not likely to happen, but it can happen. And then um, the third thing we worry about is just catastrophic failure. You know, if, if he gets too active, um, he can tear the plate and screws off the bone or break the bone. Um, and that's why we tell you for about 10 weeks, no running, no jumping. You want to keep him as quiet as you can. That'll be really tough. It is. That's the, <laughs> that's the toughest part. I always, uh, owners always assure me that I have the easy part of this deal. And I think that's, that's the case. Um, but now let's talk about... Um, you know, what if you don't do anything? You know, I get asked all the time, how painful is this? Well, clearly there's pain or he wouldn't be limping. But I don't have any question that if he were to see, you know, a cat or a squirrel or something, he'd take off like a shot. So that tells me it's not something, you know, horribly, excruciatingly painful where uh, you're here to choose between surgery and euthanasia. You know, it's not that kind of problem. But if you said, look, Dr. McDonald, can you help him? Uh, yeah, I think I can. And so to me, there are really three reasons for you to consider doing the surgery. Number one is to resolve the limp. And I can't tell you that I can make him 100% normal, but what I expect and hope for is that we make him 100% normal essentially 90% of the time. On cool damp days, like anyone who's had knee surgery, he's still gonna be a little bit stiff and sore. But the rest of the time, he should be able to run, jump, play, live a normal life. The second thing is arthritis. Now he's going to get some arthritis just because he's torn his ACL and if I go in and do surgery that creates a little bit of arthritis and that's why I can't make him 100% normal. But it should be way less arthritis than what he would get if we don't fix it and that tibia continues to slide back and forth. You know eventually it'll wear the cartilage off. And then the third thing is his opposite leg. Statistically, and, and it depends on what studies you look at, but there's up to a 30 to 40 percent chance that any dog who tears one ACL will someday tear their ACL in the opposite leg. And I can't tell you that if we fix this leg that he won't tear the other one, but commonsensically right now he's shifting most of his weight onto the good leg and you worry that he's going to overload that one and blow that ACL. The best way to keep that from happening is to get this one comfortable, get the extra weight off that leg, and then hopefully he's in the you know 60 to 70 percent that don't ever tear the other ACL. <laughs> well, good, good. I mean, I'm, I'm really glad that you could do something. Oh, you bet. I, I think we can help him. I think y'all will be pleased. I hope you will. Um, and uh, um, it's uh, the real difference between the TPLO and some of the other things is just that um, we have more margin for error. You know, if the doorbell rings and he goes tearing through the house before you can catch him, he's probably not going to hurt the TPLO. Uh, if the back door gets left open and he goes tearing out before you can catch him, he's probably not going to hurt the TPLO. Um, that's the real difference. Oh wow. It's quite the incision.